Welcome back for another fireside chat with the experts. Today I have uh, Dr. Bill Cardoso, me again, and uh, Dr. Glenn Tam- Thomas back with us. Um, today we're going to be talking about data fusion. So welcome, gentlemen. Good to have you guys. Good to be here again. Good to be here. So data fusion is a um, a neat topic. Um, I think some people use it differently than uh, what we'll be talking about. So I just want to make sure that we all start off with the same understanding. So, uh, Bill, why don't you give us just a one or two minute high level view of what data fusion is? It has to be one or two minutes. Can it be longer? Yeah. Okay. No. Timer now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Glenn, set the clock. So. Yep. Data fusion is uh, is a fairly uh, mature uh, concept that relates to uh, combining the different data streams to achieve a specific goal, right? So instead of um, uh, looking one data stream or one type of inspection or one type of uh, inform or, or data uh, separately from another one and another one, what you do is you fuse them together and there are different algorithms that you can use to uh, get to combine that information and out of that information the combined data you define uh, uh, it can be design criteria it can be pass fail criteria on the combined uh, data uh, to drive information for your um, uh, for your project so uh, it's been around for a while. I mean, it goes back to, uh, for example, you're looking at um, objects on a field and you uh, try, you know, you, you, let's say you are doing surveillance right on an airplane, you know, trying to find if you're looking for tanks, right, on the enemy territory and you want to make sure it's a tank, not a cow, right, which, believe it or not, is actually not trivial uh, to make that distinction. You might want to fuse infrared uh, data stream with a visual data stream uh, to better give you that information, right? Uh, each of these infrared or, or optical, uh, you know, visible spectrum, each one of those data streams alone might give you a certain level of, um, of, of accuracy and combined, they usually give a much better uh, accuracy. So that's data fusion in, in a nutshell. Okay, so you, you, instead of relying on one source at a time to give you information and make a decision, you're weighing these different values that you're getting, weighing the different data inputs and combined making a decision. Yeah, it's, you know, so the one plus one. Infrared says, plus hey, plus that looks like a cow, but I'm 80% sure that's a cow. And then optically it says, hey, that's, uh, I don't know, 50% of it's a cow. Then you can make a decision based off that. Exactly. Yeah. Combined instead of just independently. Makes sense. So how, how is that being used in, in manufacturing that, that you've seen so far? So we've done, uh, we, we've had deployments, for example, where we combined or fused uh, optical data with X-ray uh, data streams uh, to improve the detection of counterfeit components, right? Which is a, an example we, we clearly have. So what you yeah. do is um, every time you do inspection, right? Um, and I'm sure people on the call are familiar with it. But every time you do inspection, look for a pass fail criteria. Ideally, you have a very clear definition where to put a threshold, right? So everything lower than this threshold is fail. Everything above this threshold is pass, right? Uh, unfortunately, nature is, you know, often uh, against us as engineers. So what nature gives us is uh, normal distributions, right? Bell-shaped curves. So instead of a clear place to put a threshold, you usually end up with two overlapping bell-shaped curves. One is the pass and one is the fail population, right? Ideally, right, what you want to do is you have these two uh, bell curves as far apart from each other so you can put a threshold somewhere in between and, you know, you have a very clear distinction of pass and fail. Again, oftentimes what you end up uh, experiencing is that these two bell curves are close to each other, so the tails kind of overlap. What does it mean? That overlap means that if you put a threshold here, sometimes you're passing something that should be failed, sometimes you're failing something that should be passed, right? Because you have that 
tail uh, of the two overlapping uh, bell curves. So uh, data fusion becomes very powerful because you have the two bell curves for optical inspection, and now you have two bell curves for X-ray inspection, right? So now we have two sets of bell curves, two sets of um, two sets of uh, uh, pass-fail criteria. And what data fusion allows you to do is to say, okay, in the optical, this is marginal. How is it doing with X-ray, right? And you look look to see if that is also marginal, or if it's you know more towards a fail, a, a, fa a, a pass, or more towards a fail, right. So based on that, um, uh, now your pass fail criteria is not you know uh, two dimensional. We have three dimensional in space uh, to map where you're going to pass and fail things, right? Which improve your ability uh, to reduce. Uh, false passes and fal false positives and false negatives. Does it make sense? Right. Yeah. So, so I, I think um, historically speaking, like electronics, for example, you have a circuit board that's starting in a certain spot, bare board, it's going to go through a process, right? So yeah. it, you stick some solder paste on there and it goes to SPI. And SPI is going to say, that's good, go to the next line. Correct. That's pretty much all you get out of it, right? Or it says, hey, that's fail, reprint it. Correct. And it's going to go through the whole thing, and then again, it hits AOI, and the AOI machine says, hey, that solder joint doesn't look good, or this component's flipped around, or something. Um, and that alone is its own kind of island where you make decisions off of, right? And the same for AXI. So the idea with data fusion is that you start saying, hey, AOI thought this kind of looked bad. Maybe, maybe it's a cold solder joint. What does it look like under X-ray? And if you can fuse that data, you can make a much more educated decision rather than yeah. just kind of alone. You could use this concept to strengthen your inspection when your inspection is barely meeting the minimum, right? Yeah. Uh, due to circumstances of the inspection itself, not necessarily the modality, but the component may be more difficult to image the sample is difficult to image. Uh, so you have a, a suspect, uh, no matter how you try to image the product, you have some suspect uh, results, right? So the more data streams you can add into the equation, the more positive you're going to get on all of those dubious results. So you, you can uh, essentially, they'll all add up to one, whereas singularly they may be 0.25, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very it's very easy to get uh, 80, 90 percent, um, you know, um, uh, accuracy in in the single modalities nowadays, right? SPI machines are highly evolved, so they're basically very good at getting the most of that um, uh, Gaussian, right? The, the bell curve that 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 is not overlapping with the other one, right? For the pass for the pass side for the fail side, so the ninety well, plus percent uh, for all these machines uh, can be achieved today with the high end systems available on the market. The really tricky thing is it's 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 the diminishing returns, right? To get to the to the end, right? To get to the point where we start uh, getting to the uh, overlapping uh, bell curves, that's where data fusion plays a role, right? The problem we have is that not a lot of people are doing. I don't know anyone doing it right now. Cross modalities, right? It's not trivial, and uh, that's something that we've been doing with optical and X-ray uh, for a while now. And um, I think there's a lot of potential in the market for non-destructive testing, right? As we can um, uh, correlate or fuse uh, laser scanning data with uh, CT and other types of uh, X-ray inspection. I think there's quite a bit of potential there, and that's that's what we're exploring right now. So, people interested in figuring that out, uh, yeah, give us a call. So we do. Right. Yeah. So, um, combining optical and X-ray, you know, we just mentioned uh, electronics, but um, outside of that, you know, we we've, we've done. Um, I don't know how much we can talk about it, but uh, you know, barcode—not just barcode scanning, but integrity of it. Right? Yeah, 
yeah. integrity of, of things uh, on the on the on the widget that needs to be inspected or looking at hey, is it passed this test? Is it passing that test? Um, and maybe that's not quite uh, using it, at least the example I'm thinking of, but it's well, a matter it's, of taking yeah. all, all these things, right, right? Lots of data streams together and saying, hey, yeah. you know, your product gets a score of, you know, seven out of 10 or 9.5 yeah. or overall. And infrared or ultrasound, eddy current, I mean, all these different modalities, right, can be fused yeah. with x ray and optical inspection uh, to augment the uh, probability that you're going to make the right decision. Right. Yeah. And it's old school to think of each one of those data streams as an independent uh, decision making process. Right. That's old school. Now, with the computing capabilities we have, uh, it, it became um, silly not to take advantage of these different data streams. To, because at the end of the day, what you want to do is transform data into information. Right. right. Data you don't need, data that you don't use has a very, uh, Define name is noise, right? It's useless. If you don't use it, it's useless and it's noise. So uh, the what we're talking about here is uh, to design an algorithm that can turn data into information. And information is data you actually use and you actually uh, mm -hmm. employ to improve your processes and um, improve the overall quality of your manufacturing. Right. right. Yeah, so how do we actionable uh, or actions come out of it, right? Exactly. You have a, a stream of numbers coming at you. You can't do much with that. Um, but once you can turn that into something that I can I can read, I can understand, I know what to do with this product now. Maybe I know how to take it back and go improve that. Uh, you know, one of the things we had had talked about was if you're going through again back to electronics, right? You, you put down your solder paste on the board, SPI. Image is the whole thing, right? You get all your data out of that. Um, but where exactly is the threshold? What is good? What is bad? Well, if you can now take your outputs at the end of the line and AOI gave it a passing score, AXI gave it a passing score, but it was kind of marginal over on the SPI side, you know, you can sort of train your, your earlier inspection points based on the output and results. If you can track that product uh, through the whole the whole process. Exactly. Right. Right. So we can automate some of those processes, right? Um, we could automate improvements in the process based on the thresholding. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's what a lot of people are looking for, especially you know, now where they're I keep people uh, apart. It's even more of a push to automate things. Um, yeah. Make things. So with that in mind, learn. what's the ability to augment uh, data fusion with AI? So, yeah. So when we talk about, that's a good question. When we talk about that algorithm, right, that's going to fuse the data, um, yeah, AI plays a huge role on that algorithm, that black box, right, that we design to fuse this data. And what we've done, it's very powerful, is uh, to adopt a training process to design the, the data fusion uh, algorithm. What does it mean? It means that you can actually look at all the data, uh, data streams and train which data streams, right, which uh, extreme cases that were uh, previously ambiguous, right? We're hard to determine. You can train AI to identify those extreme cases and give you a pass, uh, uh, an accurate pass or fail uh, result, right? So let's put that into an example, right? To, um, to make it less cryptic. <clears throat> you have a, a board that passes SPI. It's not 100%, but it passes, right? Then it goes from AOI uh, after uh, picking place and passes that as well. And then it passes uh, AXI, right? And at each one of those steps, that pass was not, you know, with flank callers or somewhat marginal, but it passed each one of those stages. Uh, and you know that that 
specific board with that set of results, right? Even if if it passes ICT, you know, uh, in circuit test, is going to fail in the field after six months, right? So you can embed that level of knowledge, that level of information into your AI data fusion uh, algorithm to say, you know what? Even though we passed everything, let's fail this board, right? Let's take it aside and rework it. Let's do something with it because I know that there's a you know X percent chance that that board is going to become an RMA, right? So that's not possible without data fusion, right? That's not possible if you're not looking at your manufacturing process or your your SMT line as a um, you know a fluid um, uh, process that gives you information. I mean. We know that a lot of times uh, our customers collect data and put it in a box, right? And then do anything with it. You know, it's not it's not easy, right? And a lot of these machines, SPI, AOI, and um, and uh, ICT machines, they were designed to crank up data and put it in a box, right? They're not designed to crank up data and share with other people. So there's work to be done there, right? As a community of uh, companies that sell equipment, right? We we um, we we have to uh, we're challenged, right? Because at the same time, we want to collect data and provide information to the users of uh, the data, so they can turn into information and and um, and uh, improve their process. At the same time, we want to keep that information to ourselves, right? We don't want to share it with our competitors. So we have that challenge going on now. But uh, I'm a big believer that. Uh, considering the SMT line as a fluid process that uh, has transparency, right? And has that, uh, and with transparency, we have the ability to look at uh, how each machine is performing, what kind of results we're getting, so that you, at the end of the day, you, you know, the uh, our customer has the ability to stop a board that will fail, even though it's not working out. I think it's very powerful. That's the future, right? I know as, as a community, we're not there yet, but we have to very soon. Right. So with that thought in mind, what is the feasibility of adding a data stream from the field, from RMAs or from service technicians? That would essentially be an analog data stream, right? Uh, so I could see it, products that have um, long life cycles and long iterations. Let's say we're in iteration 11 right this has been a 10-year period that we have uh, been building this product we still don't have a grasp on some aspects would feeding that rma data and feeding that service data and failure data in the field or from the field back into the uh, algorithm and back into the fusion what would that benefit be would there be a benefit to that the benefit is that it gives you almost like a minority report situation, right? You'll be able to foresee the future, right? You'll be able to know uh, what's going to fail before it fails, right? And um, and again, a lot of these SMT lines today are running at 90 plus percent accuracy, right? But they don't really know if that's true, right? If that 90% SPI accuracy or 99% SPI accuracy means anything, right? It means something for the SPI machine, but what does it mean for the product that the customer is experiencing, right? So right now we have silos of, of data being generated in, uh, in, in, in our factories, right? And, um, and I think the great dis disruption that's, that's happening slowly, but it's happening, is that transparency. So uh, if data uh, can permeate from system to system, and um, this overall data collection can happen. Um, I mean, you know, you know, another analog or semi quasi analog data stream is inventory control, right? Is the stuff you put in your boards, are they counterfeit or not? Right? What's right. the chance that the stuff you put in your board is actually legit? Right? The manufacturing line has very little access to the inventory and vice versa, right? Because that needs uh, access to your ERP system, right? I mean, I use so that ability to start putting together data streams is 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 critical, right? I mean, COVID helped a little bit, right? Nudged companies to realize that uh, wait a minute, 
Now, you know, I need to have fewer people on the floor. Perhaps I should start looking at automation. But a lot of the automation conversation we have is a much lower level, right? Is that uh, business intelligence that we have. It's figuring out how good your machine is uh, from an efficiency perspective, right? Uh, Glenn, you know this better than anybody else. Is you basically extract, you know, how uh, good operator A is compared to for operator B at finding errors, right? And having those dashboards, managing dashboards, all the stuff that we have with uh, TrueView BI. But um, I think the opportunity is, is is much bigger, right? Oh, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think you're getting there or we'll get there at some point? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is is the AI, AI gets more uh, accepted? And uh, I think a lot of it is not necessarily the technology. We have the technology and we have the algorithms. We have the capability. I think it's acceptance on the floor. Uh, you know, and it's uh, even manufacturing managers and some of the the mindsets need to change in the manufacturing arena to accept what that black box is giving them. Uh, you know, uh, old school guys, you know, they like joysticks. Try to convince them to use a, yeah. a keyboard. It's like, you know, almost impossible. <laughs> uh, so uh, a lot of it is uh, open mind, uh, you know, companies with open mind and willing to accept change and uh, inviting that uh, old school resistance. Well, we've always done it this way and it's worked just fine, right? So exactly. as with any emerging technology, there's always going to be some resistance yeah. into uh, the, you know, to the bottom line, to the paycheck gets bigger, right? We ship more product, we have less yep. returns, our company is more successful than it was two years ago based on that black box, right? So, I mean, we, we struggle with the joystick question, right? Because we really like a joystick. Can you imagine when we have to convince them that they don't need to look at an extra image at all? Exactly. Right? I mean, it, if you think about it, why do you have to look at an extra image? We have algorithms and a bunch of other technology that can make those decisions for you, right? And the, the extra image, that grayscale image that they see today is at some point going to be a thing of the past, right? I mean, we can, we'll provide it as a comfort blanket, but at the end of the day, it's it's it, fully automation, right? If you have an autonomous system, it, it will become irrelevant, right? Or not important for the decision-making process. And the uh, it's, I don't know if that might even be a generational thing, right? And especially when we talk about uh, self-driving cars, right? Uh, the my kids have a much, or I would expect they have a least uh, 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 their process right to adopt uh, to be comfortable in a driverless driverless uh, vehicle. It's going to be much much less friction than what we have, right? Our kids just get and say, "Yeah, this is awesome." My, my dad used to drive the schmuck. No, I don't have to drive. I just push a button and go where I have to go, right? Yeah. It kind of makes me feel sad to never have the, you know, pleasure of changing oil and, you know, smell gas and drive a V8 down the street. But I guess that's the price of, of evolution, right? Right. Right. Yeah. And I think as we're along the road to get to this point of AI, data fusion, ad adoption, uh, it's critical that we start or we, we continue to gather the data, right? In your example of uh, sending a product out in the field and it uh, fails in six months instead of the expected five years. Um, if you look back, what you have to do at that point is say, okay, serial number one, two, three failed at six months. What data, what do I know about that thing before it left the shop? Um, and then you go to your AI and you say, hey, you know, here's all the AOI images, here's all the AXI images, the SPI data, the uh, the operator decisions that was made, the in-circuit test data, all of this resulted in a premature failure. And you just you just throw it at the AI, right? And then you you just have to do that enough times. Yeah. Or finally the AI is gonna 
you know, it's not going to tell you, hey, it, it's going to fail because of that. But when you're giving it all, you know, a ton of information, something that's going to trigger and say, hey, this thing's probably going to fail. I'm, you know, 75% sure this one's going to fail at eight months. And, um, you know, that, that's the part that makes it hard to adopt AI. It's not going to tell you why necessarily. Um, right? Because it is that, that black box side of things. But it's, if you start giving it, feeding it that information now, you should have a pretty good data set, you know, a couple of years from now. It's going to yeah. take time. So essentially, we could um, apply the concept of um, planned obsolescence down to a, an absolute day, right? <laughs> the day the warranty runs out or the day your contract expires, yeah. it's going to break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's That's the exact date, exact amount of solder I need on that joint to get it to break at 366 days. Exactly. exactly. We have, uh, I mean, from, you know, the invention of capitalism, right, by Adam Smith to the invention of the production line by Henry Ford, I think companies are really good at collecting data, right? And, um, and I think and that was the previous industrial revolution. I don't know, you know, depending on how you count it, right, it can be the third or the second or the fourth. Um, and the next industrial revolution, which in my book is the fourth, will not necessarily improve data collection, but it will improve data analysis, right? Is using all the data the companies collect every day. And as I said before, that data dies in black boxes in the line, manufacturing lines around the world, right? Is to get that data out of those silos and make that data available uh, so that AI algorithms can figure out how to improve manufacturability and quality with the data collection, right? So the, the nemesis here is compartmentization mm -hmm. of data, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Quality has their compartment. Uh, incoming inspection has their compartment. Manufacturing has theirs. Engineering has theirs. So, uh, so essentially, we're looking at multiple uh, inroads into that box. But uh, how do we get the, the data reliably to the person that needs it uh, when they need it? I mean, I think that's key. If um, you know, I've sent out 10,000 failed products. They're going to fail as soon as they hit the floor, right? Uh, I really needed that data yesterday instead of tomorrow, right? So how do we, we make that data accessible to more individuals in the company? Yeah. You know, that's and, and also how you need the data, right? Because just like that person that tells you, oh, isn't water refreshing in a hot day when the person is actually asking for a glass of water, right? So a lot of times that's how we get data gets delivered to decision makers, right? Oh, isn't water refreshing in a hot sunny day when the data is actually telling you, I'm thirsty, put a stop button because we're going to start shipping that product, right? <laughs> so and that's something that has to be, can be topic of next, uh, you know, a future fireside chats, right, David? So with yeah. that thought, would that be diluting the problem or diluting the answer? Or both. <laughs> or both. Both. Talking about water. It's going to dilute everything. Exactly. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, we are uh, at 1030. We'll have to stop here. Appreciate your time again. As always, pleasure talking with you, Glenn. You bet. Um, talk to you all again soon. See, he doesn't say pleasure talking to me, Glenn. Just you. Do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> wasn't this time <laughs> <laughs> all right guys talk to you later thanks all right. bye Take care.